full speed ahead here. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm recording. We're back on. We're back on. Okay, so the question was: Is uh, I guess simply put, who are you? <laughs> Where are you coming from? Tell us your story All right. before the big. Oh, you party. asked for it. All right. Yeah, yeah. I'm never gonna stop talking. Oh, you asked for. It. All right. So my name is Ray. I'm from New York City. <clears throat> I'm a first generation first generation immigrant to New York City because I came to New York when I was two years old. My family from Egypt came over for the promise of a better life in America, right? First, my father came over, worked hard as a dishwasher. He had a PhD, but he still worked as a dishwasher because he couldn't speak the language, right? Married some fat American woman to get the green card. Same old story that all North Africans, probably Indian men know as well, right? And uh, brought over my mother and sister. Grew up in New York in the 80s and 90s, real rough place, right? It's very different from what it is now. Learned how to do business by working at my parents' newsstand candy shop in Columbus Circle. And that's why I, uh, I became an entrepreneur, if you will, because I understood the core concept of talking to people, getting feedback from people, learning, learning to process what's important and discard what is not, and looking for problems to solve. I was a very good problem solver as a young boy, and that's why I'm a good entrepreneur now. So I got my first computer real late when I was 19 years old, immediately started building stuff, taught myself how to code. My first startup was like the Groupon, using SMS messaging back in like 1999. Didn't work out because Americans didn't even know what a text message was back then, and retail merchants weren't into it, so I pivoted to ringtones, and I started the world's first peer-to-peer to got people to upload these primitive Nokia RTTDL codes as notes, and then I would send it to them by hacking the phone carrier's web forms of text messages. So I built a business off of that. It was very successful. It was like the Napster of ringtones. I had a six-figure legal bill every month dealing with all the music publishers and all the copyright issues. This is when Napster went down and um, taught me a big lesson there. But uh, I did very well with that venture and uh, Bought my mother a house and well, what was the lesson? Great. Ray, what was the lesson? You said there was a big lesson in there. Just curious. Uh well the lesson was that <laughs> so look, I, I thought I was the man because I, I built a service that I, it was making like up to like a million dollars, I think, a month at one point, back in like nineteen no, two thousand and one. That's amazing, right? However, and, and I went to the, the music publishers and I told them, Hey guys, here's the deal. I'm charging $2.50 to send people these little uh, ringtones. And I will give you $2. Uh, and I'll just keep 50 cents. That's what I told them. Because they were really high on their horse after taking down Napster, right? So I got ASCAP, BMI, Harry Fox, all of them around the table, New York. And I posed them this and I said, hey, this is completely new revenue. It's not going to cut into your existing revenue at all. And you can use it even to market your songs. It's a win-win. What could be better than this? Their response, no. Our business model is we get paid every single time the ringtone goes off or is played, not when it's downloaded. So we can't do this. So the big lesson was no matter how hard you work or how well you swing the deal, if it's dependent on other factors, sometimes you won't you won't manage to win out there. But it was a very sobering lesson. I had to really grow up after that, you know, and um, we're kind of a similar place right now in crypto, right? Where the authorities are pursuing a policy of uh, regulation through prosecution, right? Which is not really very healthy, a very Anglo-Saxon way of kind of doing things. Um, it does work in some ways, but now we're seeing we're in the age of compliance and it's up to us to educate the regulators, to work with them. This is something we have to do. We can't have an antagonistic relationship, right? If I had an antagonistic relationship with the music publishers, I wouldn't have even gotten into that boardroom. And it's true, it didn't get hardly anything out from them, and they basically screwed over their entire industry, but I'm hoping that won't happen now, because back then it was just me. And now we literally have this amazingly massive industry of millions of crypto people around the world, and they're not just dudes in their mother's basements. They're guys like you and me. There's also billionaires here. There's, there's women. There's, there's everybody. So... Now that we have a social movement behind us, I know this time we'll actually do it. And we'll close the deal. We'll work hand in hand with the regulators all over the world. And we'll bring solutions to the people. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so you you uh, had this crazy experience with this uh, this entrepreneurial venture. What, what followed that? 
Yeah, well, <laughs> that's another story, right? So after I bought my mother a house, I said, hey, I'm, I'm done. Well, after that, I actually started another um, uh, social media startup. And uh, it was actually doing very well. We were the first ones to do virtual gifts. This was uh, when the MySpace was hot and Facebook was just taking off. We got on Wired Magazine and we got on National TV, again, a bootstrap venture. And I proved to the world that social media could make money with something other than advertising. That was my mission there. I wasn't actually trying to create a sustainable business. I was rather arrogant after my success and I thought I could do it again. And I did to a certain extent, but I didn't have the stamina to continue that job. Was that, that was actually a pretty impressive product. It had the news feed. That was where Facebook got the idea for virtual gifts. That's where Facebook got the idea to do that. They couldn't make it work. It was revolutionary back then, but I didn't, I didn't want to keep pushing it forward. It, it would have gone to an OnlyFans-like place where I cut people in on the proceeds of the virtual gifts that they got. But anyway, I don't want to, I might relaunch that one day soon because it's still revolutionary. But I just did that as an experiment. I didn't want to stick around. I, I was basically completely burnt out and, and rather insane after that time because I built two companies by myself. I actually coded everything, did everything, put these like full stack. Like I, I could not delegate any work at all. Like I was such a control freak. I had to have perfection every way and I figured out how to do everything by myself. And that was the lesson I had to learn. You studied programming or what, what did you like? Is that, so are you, are you, are you one of those guys that's just been programming since you were a kid or like what's uh, No, I got my first like, computer at 19. I was Yeah, so you were saying, and then, so, but it sounds like you're also a business guy. So like, I guess how do those yeah. two worlds kind of collide or you've always just been passionate about both things? Well, I've always been a business guy, but when I got my first computer, I got really curious. And when, when I when I attach myself to something, it's just all out, balls out. There's nothing else. Gotcha, and gotcha. I learned how to code. I taught myself how to code. I taught myself SQL. I taught myself Linux. I taught myself Crazy. Photoshop. I taught myself each. I taught myself every JavaScript, every little thing I needed to learn. Nice. To make a business work. I learned. Right. That's just how I am personally. Mm. Um, and that's why I had no life. I had no girlfriend. I was a virgin till I don't even want to say. Like I'm a super <laughs> mega nerd. Like to the max, man. To the max. Like no one can, no one can compare, man. I, I can't even begin to breach the term, the enormity of the nerdiness level that we're talking about here, man. <laughs> as you were, as you were. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> at ease soldier at ease yeah so after that after um i just had to leave the whole startup tech scene because i was just i couldn't be in that scene i needed time away completely like i was someone that literally worked like 21 hours a day every single day looking at a computer screen putting up servers doing everything myself because i couldn't didn't want to delegate i just i knew i could do better and faster than anyone else and that's one of the big lessons i learned i'm the ceo now of a company of 300 people in seven offices around the world so I had to really change. Every new phase of your life will acquire a different version of you, right? I was, you know, a commando nerd superhero before doing everything myself, no matter what it was, no matter how obscure the skill. And now it's very different. Now I'm the energizer type of leader, CEO, where I inspire and guide and help people, right? I don't do much work myself now, which is painful for someone like me because I love to work. You know, I love to get my hands dirty. However, I'm still doing customer support every single day on Paxful. I'll get into that later. But yeah, after after that, I I, went, I kind of went through my ashes time. I said, fuck all this. Started traveling the world. Couldn't even look at a computer screen for three years. Didn't even look at one. Got an old like brick phone that I wouldn't even have to look at a digital screen. I just traveled the world, did martial arts, did MMA, did boxing, went to Asia, went all over the planet. Learned a lot of skills, had some crazy wild adventures. It was a good time. Um, I mean, it was a very, very hard time, but it was a good time for me to grow and discover myself. So I came back because my mother sold her house and got a, she got a divorce. So I had to buy her a new house, right? What happens? I said, okay, I'm gonna go back and start, get back into the tech game. It still seems to be going, right? Hasn't gone anywhere. And uh, I knew I was good. What happened? Came back, started something didn't work, started something, didn't work, started something. I, like I went through 11 different startups and some of them made money. Some of them produced a revenue stream, but because I knew I couldn't be the best at it, I just said, no, I have to, I was so competitive. That I knew whatever I did, I had to be the absolute best, the absolute best. Like I had to redefine and it couldn't just be incrementally better than, than what was before or around. It has to be orders at least two orders of magnitude better. 
it's hard for me to quantify what that means, but that's the only way I can really explain it. That, that's what drives me. I have to create value, unprecedented value, visionary value. So then I kept failing. I kept, you know, not going to work. Go to the next one. Not going to work. Go to the next one. Oh, it's making money. Not going to work, but it'll still keep me from focusing on something really big. On to the next one. 11 of those. Finally, I meet this dude named Arthur Schalbach in my first Bitcoin meetup in New York at the Bitcoin Center. What year are we in, sorry? What the, year are we in now? Uh, this is uh, 2013, late 2013, I think it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, he was the first person I met at my first Bitcoin meetup. We became friends. We were really two tall guys there, so I guess we got along. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we just started a, um, a POS for retail merchants to accept Bitcoin. It didn't work because... There was no Bitcoin around and the guy selling hot dogs not going to learn how to take Bitcoin. There's no one asking for it. You know, it just didn't make sense. So I spent a year like that with our tour. We ended up homeless together because we ran out of money to do that. And uh, finally, we pivoted to uh, Bitcoin and gift cards, right? A way to sell Bitcoin using retail economies. We were trying to think, how the hell can we get Bitcoin into the hands of all these normal people, right? We're trying to get retail people to use Bitcoin, but he was like, no, forget it. Why are we going to learn how to do this thing and get this wallet and this phone and then no one's coming here? It doesn't make sense. So what other way was there to get to the retail side, to get to the mainstream? It was our mission. The reason me and our tour bonded is because we believed that Bitcoin could help the little guy. So that was the original mission of Bitcoin, that it wasn't just an asset class for rich kids to play with, that it was a real tool for real people to use every day. And that's what kept us together. And that's what kept us, you know, together still through being homeless, right? Like, it takes a lot to keep people together for that. You need some kind of ideology or love between those two people. And that's what we have. We believe in the, what, the, the original mission of Bitcoin. So we decided to pivot to gift cards and Bitcoin because we knew that was the way that we could actually get to the retail market, mainstream people. And there was already a $140 billion economy. So we created Paxful for that purpose. And it, all it is is three things, a listing service, an escrow, and a wallet. Essentially the same thing local Bitcoins have. But our focus was a little different. It wasn't, it was, you know, it started off as buying and selling Bitcoins. But really, ultimately, for this thing to work, Bitcoin should become invisible. And it should really function as a universal translator of money. You know that any form of money you have, whether it's a gift card, cash, bank transfer, PayPal, whatever, Alipay, you can take that and buy big, like trade that for some Bitcoin and then take that Bitcoin and sell it and get another type of gift card or a cash deposit in Cambodia or a bank transfer in Thailand or any form of our from money can be converted into any other form of money using Bitcoin as a clearing layer. So ultimately, Bitcoin should be invisible for this to actually, for it to work best for the people, at least in the first stage. And we learned this from our users, especially our African users, Nigerian users especially. They were quite brilliant at figuring this all out. They're the one that showed us what Bitcoin's killer app really was. And it's not a, a currency to buy coffee around the world. It's as a universal translator of money, a clearing layer for all the world's value in whatever container it might be in. So that's what got us here. We're here now at Paxful. We have 5 million users around the world, customers, learning from them every day. We're launching all these new products. Uh, we've had some real growing pains over the past two years. And, uh, you know, not many people have actually heard of us outside of crypto, even within crypto. People aren't still aware of what we do. But dare I say that Paxful is the greatest company, not just in crypto, but I think in the world, because we have the greatest mission in the world. We really do want to help people. And we know exactly how to do it. And we're not just waiting until we become billionaires and make it before we start giving back. We've been giving back from day one. Built with Bitcoin is our initiative to build 100 schools and wells all across Africa and the emerging world. Very happy to say we're on school number four and well number four. We've created sustainable wells wow. in four huge districts in Africa, serving over 2 million people. Mm. We've built schools. Uh, the first two schools in Rwanda service 400 children. Our school in Kenya is done. It just won't open until Corona is finished. And our school in Nigeria has already begun construction. 
and they all come with wells as well. So everyone is invited to join us in Built with Bitcoin. We've worked with several people to build wells and contribute to the schools, but it's just another example of what crypto can really do for the people, what Bitcoin can do. So yeah, I'm a pretty idealistic guy, despite having a very colorful past. <laughs> oh, by the way, I don't even know. There's so much there that I want to uh, ask you about. But let, let, okay, let, let, let's maybe focus a bit on, and I love the stuff you guys are doing in Africa. I've been following you on Twitter for some time, I think. India's I mean, next too, it, bro. I love the Indian people, man. I'm the Hanuman, bro, of crypto. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. You, so you did a bit of MMA as well, eh? So uh, yeah, yeah. Did, did you know that martial arts was invented in India? A lot was mentioned. In a India. lot was invented yeah, in India. spaceships and all this stuff <laughs> back in the day, but but, but tell me more about. I, I'm curious, like to know a bit more about Paxful. So so initially, it started off as like a more local um, connect with people and buy Bitcoin. But then at one point, you guys saw this opportunity around the gift cards, or was the gift card kind of preceded this this other uh, kind of format of how you you know how, I guess I'm just curious like when did the gift card thing really start to resonate with your client base and were you guys like yeah this is big yeah so here's the hold on I have to blow my nose sir yeah, yeah. so here's the deal me and my co-founder were homeless in New York we were literally surfing couches for on and off for three months we had to decide between a server for Paxful or or, and, and the former startup as well, we put was called Easy Bits, or a place to live, our own apartment. We chose the server instead. So one day, you know, after me walking the streets for a couple of weeks, you know, on and off, a friend of mine says, hey guys, you guys look really haggard, man. What are you doing for money right now? Did you know you can, you can actually make a profit selling Bitcoin for gift cards? And I'm like, really? Why? That sounds like a scam. But I tried it and it worked. And I was trading on local Bitcoins, uh, Bitcoin Talk, WhatsApp, Telegram, etc. And I was actually making a, a business out of this. And we're like, hey, this thing actually works. And gift cards can actually get us to the retail user. This is our in into the retail economy, right? It's a huge, this is a massive hack, as I saw it. We got Bitcoin to the mainstream. So we jumped all over it. We built Paxful. Made it easy, easy to use. And the reason Paxful was so successful isn't because we got lucky. It's because when the mainstream came to us, we didn't turn them away. You know, oh, you're too dumb to use Bitcoin. You have to learn how to copy and do that. Like most people can't even copy and paste a Bitcoin password on a mobile phone. You know how scary that is, right? Like I had to walk middle-aged women and people through the art of buying and using Bitcoin. It's not easy. And from that, I learned how to actually tailor make a product for the mainstream for the unbanked ironically the unbanked in america came to us first but paxa was created to serve the unbanked and underbanked in africa and the emerging world and then they came next because our product actually worked so we made the most of all of this energy that was coming at us fascinating fascinating hey okay so um man okay i, I want to just step back a bit here so so you know about all the challenges we've faced, obviously, in India, right? I don't want to go too much into it right now. We can do another call. But, you know, banking is not re a requirement for Bitcoin to work, right? A lot of people don't quite get that. Bitcoin is like this parallel universe. And I find it super fascinating that instead of tapping into the banking network to enable people, you guys are almost enabling, I guess, could you say the balance sheets of companies like right because i mean when i have an amazon gift card or a gift walmart gift card i'm essentially holding money that's with walmart i mean how, tell me like walk me through this like how is it it sounds genius um and then the next thing i wanted to ask you was just some of these like challenges you've been facing and how do you guys overcome them and what do you need for like the community to help you guys kind of get to where you need to go um but yeah but before that you know what is is that what's happening here so you guys are essentially circumventing the need for banking uh by using balance sheets and then also creating this like conduit for people to just spend their bitcoin simultaneously so they don't even need to ah talk to me exactly, talk to me exactly. 
<laughs> yeah, so just like in the beginning with the, my ringtone startup, I hacked the cell phone carrier's web form so we could send free text messages so I can transmit the ringtones directly to the people and save them from typing in the codes. That was the value that made the business work. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The value here is that using Bitcoin and gift cards, we can actually get a connection to every major retail economy in the world through Bitcoin. They bought the, cell phone, the card companies have already given us this huge huge angle to a 140 billion dollar economy basically at that point every single merchant in the world like amazon they can accept bitcoin already through a, a service like Paxil. and not only that they can often accept bitcoin with a 50 percent discount right that people were selling their gift cards for a massive discount to get uh bitcoin for a while anywhere from 50 to 10 percent right so it's a huge win it's like it's a brilliant hack we didn't figure this out ourselves. We got to this because of necessity and because of danger, but the challenges are real. For So every single gift card program in the world, 98% of them actually, they all go through two American companies, Encom and Blackhawk. Two smaller companies, you know, not many people know much about them and they don't share their ledger. Meaning they will not, it's not public information. You, you don't know how much this Amazon gift card code has. There's no way to check. They do not give you access to their ledger. So they've kind of put a data embargo on the world and on us and on our users, particularly our after users that get the gift cards and exchange them for Bitcoin as a way to enter the crypto economy. That's caused tremendous challenges, tremendous challenges. You can look at my Twitter and you'll see people angry that the Africans angry that they lost a dispute against someone for the gift card because they gave him the gift card and the person said the card is bad, but they swear the card is good. But meanwhile, we don't know which card is good or bad because no one can possibly check. And the guy that got the code might have gotten it from five other guys before him. So this causes a lot of challenges, a lot of pain. However, we still did it anyway because it was a major power move. Think about it like this. Everyone's talking about Africa right now. Everyone's trying to get into Africa and crypto. Four years ago, no one was talking about Africa. I was the only one. Me and my co-founder went to Africa and we were like, wow, this place is amazing. The people are amazing. They have real issues that Bitcoin can help them with. And I said, Africa is going to lead global Bitcoin adoption. Literally, people laughed in my face saying the Africans couldn't figure it out. They only make $2 a day, blah, blah, blah. It's a joke. That's not the case now. Africa's leading global crypto adoption through online searches, the sheer number of tra transfers and trades. It's amazing what's happened. But before that could happen, we had to get crypto into Africa, particularly Nigeria, which is the lion of Africa and the biggest economy and population in Africa. The problem is, <clears throat> it's very hard to get money out of Nigeria. There are whole companies that specialize just in getting money out of Nigeria, whether it's through animal skins or cacao beans or what have you. So we had to figure out a way to give the Nigerians a way to acquire Bitcoin to pay for it. And we did. It wasn't banking, because their banks in Nigeria wouldn't let them send money out of the country because the national government wants to keep their euros and dollars in the country for themselves to buy weapons or medical supplies or whatever. So what are the people to do? So it's simple. We found a digital asset that the Nigerians could import through their ingenuity and sell for Bitcoin. Can you guess what that digital asset was? It was gift cards. So a gift card is just a code on the back of a plastic card. That with a cash receipt that proves it was purchased for <coughs> with cash, not a reversible method like debit cards, makes it a safe proposition. <coughs> Assuming the card code is good, boom. That's why when we got to Nigeria, the price of Bitcoin was about 30 to 40% over market. Now it's market price. That challenge had to be conquered first before Africa could really embrace Bitcoin. And it had to be conquered in Nigeria, which is a notoriously hard place to do business, of corruption, etc. We didn't let that scare us. Nigerian people are good people, hardworking, motivated, educated overwhelmingly honest you know that's the thing that there are a lot of scammers in nigeria but they work for professional scamming rings usually run by outside people like oligarchs from russia or other corrupt african leaders or whatever it might be so we caught we went right at that challenge head up first right on the front lines and we got crypto into africa and now we're trying to do that in every small every african country because the end goal of all of this is create a really a golden age in Africa 
And that sounds crazy, but it's not. I know exactly how to do that. We've already started with the hardest part, which is to create a pan-African settlements network. Using Paxful right now, with any two peer-to-peer -peer trades, you can turn any form of money into any form of money. For a place like Africa, where it's extremely difficult to send money to the country next door, it makes all the difference. Combine that <clears throat> with a pan-African stablecoin, and we have something real there. That plus schools, wells, incubators that we should sure, we sure already had our first Paxful incubator in South Africa, but Corona slowed things down. That is the foundation for a new civilization to grow up, pan-African civilization to rise up out of the ashes, full of empowered, well-educated youth that will change the world. It's a crazy dream, I know, but that's how we think of Paxful. That's why we do things like build schools. And we think 20 years ahead. We're not thinking about just the next quarter or the big pump and dump or the land grab or this. We don't think like that. And we don't think of Africa as just a, something to go and take and territory to grab. You know, that's, the African people are not receptive to that, but they can spell all these, these predators that want to come in and just take, you know, like people talk about Africa and they talk about penetrating the market, dominating. It sounds like they sound like rapists, <laughs> you know, like they're corporate <laughs> rapists. You, know, you, you, you imagine going out to a girl and talking about that. You know, it's not, we, we don't think like that. We want to help build. We want to be generative and want to empower the people. And that's why we're so successful in Africa. That's why we're the leading cryptocurrency exchange in Africa. Because we really do care. I'm African myself. I really do care about what's happening. What's happening in Nigeria right now is heartbreaking. There are people dying. There's a lot of corruption that's finally come home to roost right now. But uh, I'm sorry, there's a little puppy here that just came over. I was playing with him. It's very cute. <laughs> I'm in a coffee shop right now. Yes, I was saying something rather epic, sir. But yeah, there's the, the NSARS issue in Nigeria is huge. I'm, uh, I'm on the. I'm talking with people all on the front lines about that constantly. I was actually in the Egyptian Revolution in 2011, like there myself in Tahrir Square, fighting on the front lines again. And uh, I came back to America, and that's when I had my political awakening. I see a lot of very similar similarities between what's happened in Egypt and what's happening in Nigeria right now. And dare I say, we'll have very similar ramifications to the world, perhaps even more. So that's something we should all be looking at and following very closely. Because Africa really is the future. I said, yeah, that that's that's uh, that's cool to hear, man. Okay, so I think that gives me a bit of context on Paxful. I'm sure we could you know riff on that for quite a while longer, but I, I do I do find what you guys are doing super fascinating and useful and you know, yeah, yeah. So, so kudos to you, my friend. Um, okay, my next question uh, was going to be around, you know, a contrarian belief, right? So like, what truth do you hold, right? And I feel like you're, you're gonna give me like a machine gun full of them, but let's just try and stick to one uh, that you hold to be true that most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on. And I think I've already heard a few of those, like, you know, whether it be four years ago, you saying Africa was going to be the future of Bitcoin. I think you hear even like Jack Dorsey and a lot of these, you know, bigger faces right now talking about it. But what, what anything more current that 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 you that you're starting to see that that you, it's just like clear as day. Um, but you know, most others are kind of way off on. <clears throat> well, I already mentioned one of them that you know the prime. The real value of Bitcoin is, is not as a currency to you know, buy coffee with, right? It doesn't have to be a direct currency all over the world. Like That might happen one day, very well might happen, but will only happen if we make Bitcoin useful on a uh, transit local level. Like Bitcoin has to be just a clearing layer to allow all these local firms of currency and money to be converted and transacted. There's a huge need for that, right? Because there is... The only clearing layer we've had up until that point is what, SWIFT? Really, SWIFT, right? Mm -hmm. A broken system of, of factions and, and, and mis, like it just, if you knew how SWIFT actually worked, you'd be horrified. Literally, it's 40 years old, right? So Bitcoin has to like solve, get, allow the money to flow again, right? It doesn't have to be used directly as money itself all the time. It can be the money used to clear money, which sounds a little bit like what, 
Blockstream is saying, but it's absolutely not. Because their whole plan was something very, very different. Focused on turning Bitcoin into a settlements network for very big players. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about turning into a settlements network for everyone. Unfortunately, Bitcoin cannot scale by itself to be able to do that. And that's why peer-to-peer people-powered marketplaces like Paxful are very important. They can actually do these. And as time goes on, Paxful won't just be a people-powered marketplace. It will become a, a network of all these financial services. And the financial services get tacked on. How? As the people, our customers ask for them. Like for five years, we supported only Bitcoin. And everyone's like, why don't you add all these other crypto? You'll make so much more money and blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, we would make more money. But again, me and my co-founder are quite idealistic. We believe that a central clearing layer should have as much momentum behind it as possible. And you're not going to achieve momentum if you distract people with 67,000 other kinds of tokens, right? So that's what's one of my beliefs. I could give you a machine gun of all of that stuff, but we both get kicked off the air and arrested immediately. So we're not going to go. There. <laughs> and then, and then, what about the same question, but as it pertains to the world? I know uh, before the the recording, you, you shared a few, but a- anything that you might be comfortable sharing publicly? Uh, not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> now it's the time of not speaking your mind, right? <laughs> It's time to shut up. Kind of funny. <laughs> that's what I got to do. My lawyer will murder me. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, that's safe. That's safe. We, we can switch gears into some other uh, less thorny topics. Actually, probably equally as thorny. But uh, yeah, if you don't want to pick up on that one, I was going to ask you something, right? What are your thoughts on, um, on AI? Do you think it's just like another word? Is it a buzzword? Do you think about it much? Uh, and I ask because it's something that... I don't know. I don't know. I have like question marks around. I still don't, haven't quite figured out how I think about it, but curious. Yeah, that is a deep topic. Uh, I don't know much about AI. I haven't studied it, but to me, if I look at it as a student of history, this topic has been discussed many times before. Rudolf Steiner, the Austrian mystic, you know, he wrote, you know, he 300 volumes on everything from Egyptology to farming to science, to astrology started the Waldorf schools, et cetera. He believed that AI or what he called AI, he called it the mechanistic. He called it the Arlemanic. Arleman being, you know, this um, um, uh, Persian deity, uh, you know, uh, Azur Mazda, Arleman. Arleman was like the bad guy. He was very mechanistic, right? Like uh, he believed that this entire mechanistic world that is, is gaining steam and control and is burying the energy world, right? Based on humanity and compassion. You could say that AI is just another buzzword for that same exact type of energy. And that indeed is what Elon Musk is talking about. Because at the end of the day, computers will only do what they are programmed to do, right? It's hard enough to get a piece of computer code to work at all. Any program will tell you, you really think it's going to take on a life of its own and come after us? No, only if it's programmed. To. So all this could be some kind of guise or code word for this. If you're really spiritualistic or animistic you could say maybe dark fallen angels will enter into machines and use them as you know whatever you can get into all kinds of weird conspiracy theories you don't need to go there but what you need to understand is that humanity has been getting leaning more and more towards the mechanistic for the past 120 years and many people tried to stop that many great scientists many great industrialists many people have tried to warn us about that the problem is they don't warn us very clearly like rudolf steiner and now Elon Musk, they're just kind of hinting at things. No one is really going to come out and tell you exactly what's wrong, because then they're sticking their neck out. Their head will get chopped off. That's basically it. <laughs> crazy, crazy. Oh, okay, so what else? Uh, what else, Ray? What, what, what if I maybe, uh, what do you wish I had asked you? Uh, anything that's, you know, kind of interesting? Or is that something you want to get out to the world? Oh, my goodness. Sir. Talk about it. Me. <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> i can see the men in black rolling down right now no no we'll, yeah. we'll keep it <laughs> yeah yeah so i'm good man i'm good so i was gonna say is, is yeah so wh- where do you want to go to go with this did you want to ask me a few questions or do you want to maybe save that for another interview uh what are your thoughts well i'm really curious about you and, and india i know you're you're talking about it never rest you know, you're always hustling out there. You're always trying to find ways for bad value. Mm. What do you think is going on in India right now? I mean, the political climate is uncertain. It seems to change based on whatever minister's feeling 
this is bad morning or whatever you think. Where do you think crypto India will be in three years from now or two years from now as far as crypto goes? And what are the big opportunities? Do you think everyone should jump into crypto in India right now? If so, at what angle? Mm, good question. Um, hmm. So first of all, are you aware of the, the recent uh, Supreme Court ruling on the central bank and what happened? You, are you aware of what happened there? Uh, no, there's been many Supreme Court rulings or I don't know. There seems to be an announcement every week. Okay, so just just by, I mean, I know we've uh, I've maybe shared this with you in the past, but real quick. So I, we started, you know, UnoCoin back in December 2013. The week after our launch of our business, the central bank, the RBI, put out a notice on their website saying that, uh, you know, Bitcoins are risky. There's concerns around security. That same notice resurfaced on that website about three or four times over the course of a couple of years. And then finally in 2017, the hammer dropped and they decided to essentially not allow banks to deal with Bitcoin companies like ours. Uh, I mean, I'm paraphrasing and kind of fast forwarding through a lot of the key events here, but, um, uh, but we essentially challenged that in court. And, uh, and a bit to our surprise, the, all three judges ruled in our favor and deemed the, uh, the notice, the bank ban notice as unconstitutional. So as of a few months ago, um, yeah, banking is back. And, you know, and that was unprecedented. I, I don't, I think maybe once or twice before in history has the Supreme Court ever overruled the RBI. Um, and, and so, so, so Bitcoin is back, uh, you know, Hey, Ray, oh yeah, Bitcoin is back in India. Um, you know, in terms of is the path ahead clear and should people jump in? I think those are two words that are interdependent in the sense that if people jump in and put resources and focus on it, the class, the path will be clear. If people stay away and just depend on like a handful of people to clear the path and then they'll enter, then maybe it won't be cleared. So the future is a function of our actions. And so I would encourage entrepreneurs that are daring and bold and smart and, you know, and, and, and are like Bitcoiners that want to kind of, you know, help the cause to definitely consider India and, and to join hands with other entrepreneurs if they want, if not great, but, but, but to figure out how to, how to make it happen because, because India is, uh, you know, it, it houses one out of every seven humans on earth. <laughs> That's a lot of people, you know, and, uh, you know, and when you think about Bitcoin, what's the first word that comes to mind, right? Digital gold. Well, where is gold the biggest in the world? India, you know, the second thing that comes to mind is remittance, right? When you think about Bitcoin, who is the biggest remitter, inward remitter in the world? India, right? And uh, you look at, you know, the fact that it helps to be a bit tech savvy. Um, well, what country has more techies? It helps to be a bit young and, you know, open-minded, a ton of young people. Uh, people speak English. I mean, people love, I mean, there's just so many variables that make it dead obvious to someone like me that Bitcoin was designed for India. But but you you said you spent a lot of time in New York. You probably had some Indian friends, right? Have you ever invited Indian people over to your house? They they tend to show up a bit late. There's it's called Indian Standard Time. People joke about it, but Indian people show up a bit late to parties. And I think it's the same thing with the IT revolution, right? It, it, it kind of hit the world, and then 10 years later, India picked up on it and then kind of you know sped ahead. Same thing with Bitcoin. I think people are a bit conscious, uh, a bit cautious, um, you know, up front, but I think people are studying it. Oh, hello. Oh, sorry. I had a little one uh, kind of crawl up on me here. Right? Um, but yeah, so I, so I think it's very, I, I'm very bullish on it. I, I, I think, uh, you know, and like yourself, I'm not from India, but my parents are, and I spent a lot of time in India growing up and, and even as an adult. And so, uh, yeah, I just see a massive opportunity there. And, and, and it's a country that really, really excites me. And so and when now with UnoCoin being back, you know, it's uh, Tim Draper just recently, uh, you know, invested in the company. And now we're, we're kind of, you know, back to the races. But, you know, two years ago, Ray, it was a very dark period, right? We had laid off, I think, almost 100 people. Our customers weren't able to, like do what they needed to do with their service with our service i mean it was it was really hard and so when you talk about some of the challenges you guys are facing i, I definitely can you know like i i i can identify with you that's for sure
Absolutely, yeah. India is definitely the place people don't realize. But you know, there's another thing that's amazing too about the Indians is their their incredible ambition and hustle. Like the Indians have a fire under them that is impressive. They're trying to figure out how to light the same fire in Africa. So that's a huge asset that the Indian people have. <laughs> another one is that um, Indians understand Hawala. They understand peer to peer. They were doing that stuff before anybody else. Hundred percent. And when you explain it to them like that, they're like, oh, wow, this is our thing. Yeah. It's not anything foreign or new. It's just another tool that they can take this peer-to-peer -peer network to another level. But now they can have these peer-to-peer Hawala -peer friends all over the world, right, that are not dependent on their trust relations. The blockchain removes that, right? Two things, two things. Define what Paxful means and then Hawala. Because I have a feeling most people... We, you and I might know, but most people might be like, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Pax means peace in Latin. So Paxful literally means peaceful. My co-founder and I decided upon that. Uh, one, because, well, the domain was available. <laughs> but two, we're looking for something with peace in it because with an honest money system, we can truly have peace in the world. If bankers, central bankers, are not allowed to inflate money at, at, the, at will, creating massive amounts of debt, then they can't fund wars because otherwise no one's going to go to war. You need trillions of dollars to go to war, right? This is the thing. Honest money system will bring us to peace and peace will bring us to wealth. And Hawala is a very interesting concept. It's something that really got its start after the Roman Empire forbid agency, right? They weren't allowing agency, meaning if you were a merchant taking your carpets from Persia to Milan and, the, and you need to collect money or make a payment, on behalf of someone else, you weren't allowed to do that. You can only do things directly with yourself. But in the worlds of business, especially before the internet or anything like that, you can't be everywhere you need to be. So agency must be there. So the Muslims, who had a very close-knit community as traders, said, hey, let's come out with our own system. And Hawala literally in Arabic means money transfer. So all it is is, hey, you're, you're my bro. I have a bro in Toronto. He wants to send some money to New York. Could he like give you a hundred bucks in Canadian dollars and then you just give me that in Bitcoin and I'll take that Bitcoin and send it to a guy in New York or sell it to a guy in New York that'll send that guy cash? And that's all it is. is wait, 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 wait. But, but it wasn't Bitcoin, right? It's just a ledger. Like, I mean, how, ledger, Bitcoin yeah. came about, but I'm saying is all yeah. they maintained between amongst one another is just, okay, I owe you a yeah. hundred you know, a piece of paper or something. It's just a ledger. <laughs> It's a trust relationship between me it's and a, you saying yes. that this guy will give you a hundred bucks. You give me the hundred bucks whenever you can, whenever I see you next to slap me that hundred and I'll give his bro the hundred in New York for my friend, George, and I'll settle up with you and George when I next meet you guys. So the whole thing is based on our trust relationship. It's a ledger we maintain between ourselves to allow this person to send the money to New York. That's all Hawala is. And all we've done in peer to peer, you know, Bitcoin crypto world is just, taking that network and now it doesn't have to be a trust relationship between me and you there's literally a million hawala friends around the world on paxel that will help me make a transfer or receive money anywhere and that's it in a nutshell it's, digital, it's really hawala. The most digital hawala <laughs> that's all it is love it blockchain bitcoin is just a component that makes that work so there's some huge challenges here because the same way the roman empire didn't like agency well believe me uncle sam doesn't like agency either so what are we going to do? We have to educate. We have to clean the whole thing up, show the world that, hey, even though we're allowing every person in the world, whether they have a bank account or not, to access every financial network, what we're actually doing is upping up the standards of compliance and AML and KYC. And we're bringing the whole world into it. And we're making this responsible. It's an immensely difficult task that no financial institution or even nation state is there to undertake but we as a community have to do this. And right now, Paxful is one of the few companies on this mission. Everyone else is still chasing speculative pump and dump land. And that's unfortunate. It was a fall off from all that stuff. We, meaning us guys in peer-to-peer uh, -peer land and Paxful have to clean up, right? Because a lot of the times people don't understand when you go to Africa or even India as well, and you mentioned Bitcoin, I swear to you, 95% of people's reaction is, oh, that's a scam. Mm -hmm. Why? was literally everyone in Africa has been scammed or knows someone that's been scammed using Bitcoin, right? Whether it's a multi-level marketing scheme or a crypto mining thing or day trading where 99% of the people lose money.
scam, 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 right? But when you, there's people are always ask them to invest in it. But when you come to them with a different dialogue and say, hey, it's not a means of investment, it's not a speculative asset, it's a means of exchange that you can use to actually use your money in any form around the world whenever you want without permission. Then they're like, really? Wow, my friend who's working in South Africa from Nigeria, maybe I could help him send money back to his family using this and make a profit for myself. And there's actually a guy in South Africa that did that, built a little version of Western Union on top of Paxful using Bitcoin and basically this Hawala system, right? Brilliant. There's so many things we can build on top of this. And the beautiful thing is, and I say this to everyone listening, you don't have to be that technical. You just have to have a good business mind. There's, there's brilliant traders on Paxful, vendors that have no idea how Bitcoin works on the blockchain mode, but they know what it is and they know the problems that people have and they make it work for those problems. That's so powerful. Love it, man. Hey, I was going to ask you one more thing. What about what's your thought on like these public companies now, like Square and MicroStrategy and, you know, sailors like the new new chat of Bitcoin or whatever, you know, it's like it, it, these big, big companies are starting to pile in. Are, do you think it's like exciting? Do you just like, ah, oh, it's just news there, you know, it's like kind of useless or I don't know. What, what do you think it signifies? I think it's really great that they're jumping in and supporting Bitcoin in, in these ways, but it doesn't really solve the problem of using Bitcoin for real use cases in the emerging world where it's needed. The only way to do that is to be on the ground, talk to the people and build specific solutions for them. But it's a great start because what they're doing is bringing more people in the West, more people all over the world into the ecosystem. So they're creating more liquidity, more, more, more on ramps as well and more off ramps to more opportunities so it's a great thing we should support it it's good but again the core work of introducing this to people on the emerging grounds emerging world has to happen on the front lines it has to happen with us hardcore crypto ogs it has to happen with the best product people in the world getting together going to you know the linear timeline for doing great things which is find a problem start solving the problem for a very specific community and iterate on that until you change the fucking world. And Ray, talk to me about PayPal, the pink elephant in the room, right? I mean, that is, some people are saying massive news. Some people are like, this is, you know, terrible. Don't don't send your money there because you're not getting your Bitcoin. Uh, are you kind of in the middle? Where where, where are you? Where do you sit with all this? And, and how do us little guys, the OGs, stay relevant in this new, you know, exciting world where Bitcoin is just normal and boring? <laughs> Um, well, I think it's great that PayPal is opening up to cryptocurrency. I think a lot of us in the scene tend to hate on the bigger players like Coinbase. We all, we all hate them now, right? But I got my first Bitcoin on Coinbase. It's a good service, right? It's gotten so many people into Bitcoin. Why should we be hating on them? Maybe they're not as strong supporters of Bitcoin as we think they should be, but hey, they're, they're one of us. They're part of the team. So whenever someone wants to join the family, let's welcome them to the family. Great. You know, trust but verify, right? So how do we verify that PayPal is actually doing a good thing here, right? A lot of it comes down to PayPal's policies on people like, for example, there are all these traders on Paxful that were selling Bitcoin for PayPal, getting their PayPal accounts shut down because they're selling Bitcoin on using their PayPal accounts, right? That is the true measure that PayPal should be judged by, right? They're allowing the real peer-to-peer -peer traders to make a living on here. And these guys are legitimate. They're declaring that to PayPal. They should be allowed to continue to operate. That's a much more important uh, like a metric for measuring PayPal's you know, health to the industry, right? But Love it. Yeah, I yeah. get to their wallet, great. I hear you. I, so what they're essentially doing is they're squishing out the little guys that are trying to make trades. And they're like, we'll take the spreads. We'll take the fees. Yeah. We don't even give you your Bitcoin. You can't come to us with Bitcoin. You can't even verify how much Bitcoin we have. It could just be an IOU um yeah but, you know, yeah and it seems like a bit of a trend with a lot of these new financial companies right they're they're kind of taking this path and hey what i mean as a bitcoiner i think you know given that it's an open system i kind of have this belief that everything serves bitcoin you know <laughs> good things bad things uh yeah. great things whatever it's all good in the hood hey ray man this, this was uh this was pretty exciting we did like an hour i don't know was there anything else you wanted to touch on i mean i'd be down to do this again uh soon if you want to go deeper into the india side of things and and kind of explore that but uh i i got to ask you a lot of the questions that i wanted to ask you 
No, this has been great. I really enjoyed the chat. I've been looking forward to this for a while. You're you're one of the realest people in crypto, Sonny. I have tremendous respect for you and your team. I think people are going to look back a few years from now and understand that what you guys did at Unocoin in 2013, uh, tremendously formative for the industry, one of the best companies in crypto. I mean, really, like what the work that you do and we do on the front lines in these places like Africa and India, that is the work that advances the entire industry truly forward. Everything else is honestly just noise or, or toxic eventually in nature. So mad props and respect to you and your team. Pleasure to have this call. You can do another one later, because India is definitely worth talking about. We have to make a huge buzz around India because people, they really don't understand the potential of that place and of those people. It's amazing. I'm down. I'm down. Okay, today, I want again, I want to keep the focus on on kind of Paxful and your story and all that. But uh, yeah, man, next week, whenever you're free, let's let's do another one. And I'd love to dive into kind of I touched on a couple of highlights, but India's a it's 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 a it's it's it's, it's a wormhole. Like you got to kind of spend some time on it. So I'd love to love to do that. Um, but always a pleasure, man. This has been this has been great. I'm so excited that uh, we got to finally do this. Yes, I am here, brother. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Have a great day. Peace to everyone. All right.